extended depth of focus IOL. So this is a new premium category of IOL. Uh, we have to get away from the diffractive multifocals, refractive multifocals. Uh, the new category basically has effects on, on wavefront, the wavefront of the lens, and, and through altering the wavefront, you can end up with a focused channel which extends the depth of field. What this gives us is sharp vision at all distances, low incidence of glare and halos, and there's less contrast loss. So down at the bottom you'll see this diagram showing the two foci of a bifocal a multifocal. Uh, over here you'll see a continuum of foci, the key point here being a continuum, which will give you good distance as well as near vision and a gradual change all the way from far to near. So the optics of this lens was developed through special wavefront engineering and this is protected by patent that will lead to a continuum of foci. Uh, also for this lens there are smooth transition zones uh, between optical zones and this leads to continuous vision from far to near without steps of jumps in vision. So the material of the lens is a hydrophobic, hydrophilic copolymer, it's two hema, and this material, which is two ethoxy ethyl metacrylate, comes in a preloaded injector system, that hence the name ready. It's a disposable injector, will go through a 2.2 uh, incision with wound ducking comes in a 0 to 30 diopter range. It has an equivalent and a 3 diopter. Uh, the vision that you get through this is relatively pupil independent, up to a pupil size of about 4. And virtually all the light that you have is available for vision. And the contrast curve is similar to, very similar to a monofocal. Uh, it has a 5 degree bulk to the haptics and it has 4 loop uh, haptics mm -hmm. giving a contact area of 120 degrees with the capsule bag. So this is a diagram showing the optics of the lens. The green zone here is about 2 millimeters across, it's 1.93, uh, which has positive spherical aberration. The red annulus is up to a 3 millimeter pupil zone, which has negative spherical aberration. So within a 3 millimeter pupil, which is pretty common for photonic uh, vision, there is an interaction between positive and negative spherical aberration, and, and this effect leads to increased depth of focus. So this is uh, just to illustrate it a bit clearer. Uh, you can see the green, positive, red negative, and the outer zone, the blue zone, is actually an aspheric monofocal. The amount of asphericity there is um, minus 0 0.14. So you can see the effect of the positive spherical aberration here, negative spherical aberration there, and this is the range of clear vision that you, you will get at the retina. So what are the product benefits? Uh, you get extended depth of focus. So you can see simulations here uh, showing that the clarity of vision is actually pretty good from plano down to various amounts of myopic defocus. And you can realistically get somewhere around 2.75 to even up to about 3 uh, of myopic defocus. Uh, here is to show you the performance of the mini well, which is in the top panel, and uh, compared to what you get in the diffractive bifocal, where the intermediate zones here you'll see will be lost. And of course, with monofocal, intermediate and near are lost. Uh, essentially, what sort of uh, performance can you get? Uh, above this line is better than 2040 vision. And down to about three diopters of myopic defocus, you expect good vision of 2040 or better. So these are uh, US Air Force 
targets uh, at three millimeters of pupil. So right at the bottom here, you'll see the visual performance of the mini well uh, for distance, intermediate, as well as near. Uh, you can compare this with some other trifocals that are on the market. So I want to draw your attention to what happens when we change from three millimeters to 4.5 millimeters pupil size. You'll see that uh, all the other uh, refractive lenses will, will degrade quality, whereas the mean well remains fairly constant. So we also have superior visual artifacts uh, with suppression with the multifocal lens. Uh, basically, with multifocal lenses, we have to deal with halos, we have to deal with glare, starburst, and so on. Uh, this is a study done by uh, our co panelists here, Professor Alpha. Uh, basically, for mini well implantation, about almost 70% do not see halos. Beyond 80% do not see starburst. And so you'll see that this is actually very good performance if you have experience with uh, previous multifocal lenses. And this is again uh, a simulation. This, this software is developed by a company called Island. And patients basically can drag sliders to, to uh, make the halo center glare approximate what they, they feel they see. So up on the left is the mini well. Uh, down here on the left is, is panoptics, which is a commonly used trifocal, so you can see the halos and the glare. Up here is the symphony, and down right here is a monofocal. So the performance of the mini well for that time viewing is, is quite impressive and appears to be comparable to the monofocal. Uh, rapid neural adaptation is another benefit. So essentially, if you are viewing at three distances, so distance, intermediate, as well as near, uh, what your brain uh, presents to you, what brain uh, is presented with is, is A, G, and E simultaneously, and you actually have to filter this out. The brain has to work to filter this out. This is not an issue with the, uh, the mini well. And, uh, this mini well lens also has been found to have a high tolerance for tilt and desaturation. Uh, for tilt, commonly in, in cataract surgery, we, we commonly see two to three degrees of tilt, maybe two to point two to point three of desaturation, and even up to five degrees for about ten percent cases, and more than 0.5 for just desaturation in about ten percent cases. So these are MTF uh, plots to show you that the from 0, minus 2.5 to plus 2.5. For this lens, it seems to be relatively unaffected by tilt. And for decentration, from 0, minus 5 to plus 5.5, uh, you'll find that it's not much affected as well. So what are the advantages, again, to summarize? Uh, basically, negligible photic phenomena, good contrast, good visual quality, and it's continuously from far to near. There's very minimal requirements for neuro adaptation. Essentially, the patients are happy with very high level of acceptance. Uh, personally, I have some experience with this lens. Uh, what I want to say is that I've not been this excited about an IOL for a very long time. Not from the time that we went from monofocals to, to multifocals. I've been really, really impressed by halo suppression. Some of my patients will ask, halos, what is that? And I actually have to show them that, that island chart of what halos look like, and they will say, no, I don't, I don't see that. So there are no gaps in vision. The near performance has been excellent. Uh, there's also much less chair time that you need to spend talking about IOL side effects. And personally for myself, I mean, in the past I've asked myself, what sort of lens would I put into my eyes if I develop a camera? And I struggle with the, with the, with the traditional now with this lens, I, 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 I can honestly say that this is something that uh, is changing my, my thought on this and I, I'm considering this lens, or a successor of this lens perhaps, uh, by the time I get a cataract uh, to implant in my eyes. So the future of respiratory correction has gotten a lot brighter. I thank you for my attention. Uh, <laughs> these questions for the end of the symposium. I am now going to introduce my second speaker. Uh, he is Dr. Victor Cabras from Manila, Philippines. And he will talk to us about his first experiences with the mini 
well. we did more and more cases, and it didn't take that long, these problems cropped up progressively. Uh, all of them, and the number of them, and combination of them. And obviously, uh, they lead to dissatisfaction. And so we have, I actually held back, and I actually stopped using multifocals for a while, because, uh, to be honest, these cataract patients of mine were now sounding like unhappy, lazy patients. Very unusual. So it would explain also why not many of my colleagues would uh, transition into multifocal IOLs because they would have to screen the patients very well. At any time, you would go to a uh, forum wherein unhappy patients would be the uh, would be the topic. Always the advice would be you have to spend so much chair time with your patients, you have to make their expectations realistic, they shouldn't be crazy, um, and it will take a long time, they have to be very, very patient. One other thing that uh, Kristen mentioned was that here in Asia, especially in the Philippines, patients pay for their IOLs, and especially this IOL, these multiple premium IOLs, are very expensive. And it's only simple human behavior economics that if a patient pays more for a certain service, he will demand more. And of course, the complaints, once they occur, will actually be magnified. And it doesn't, it becomes a very uncomfortable situation for both the patient and the doctor quite stressful actually when you have a room full of uh, patients who are complaining about things that you can't actually help except to convince them to be patient and to tolerate it. So that would be the reason. And that would also be the reason why when Sifi approached me, um, I was a little bit hesitant to, to join the study. Because I also knew, having looked back at to find out the reasons for these problems, about the problems of multifocals. And as Chris showed earlier, the multifocals have discrete focal points, fo foci, and they work on the principle of simultaneous vision, meaning to say, while one image is in focus, there are others which are out of focus, which, depending on how good your brain is, are suppressing. And those out of focus uh, images are actually what causes the halo. So, Chris showed this earlier, but let me just belabor the point. When one is looking at the A, he's actually seeing the G and the E at the same time. And he's not getting confused because his brain is telling him to suppress the G and the E. So that's, that's a, a mechanism called neural adaptation and monoptic suppression. And it's the same way when he wants to see the, the G and the E. And this is what the patients have to develop or to adapt to when we put in a multifocal lens. And you can easily imagine why they sometimes will say, I have double vision or I see halos. I looked in a little bit at the EDOF um, and I saw that there was a distinct difference. And as Chris mentioned earlier, it's not a discrete number of foci, it's a continuum. And it uh, uses a very ingenious way of using different types of spherical aberrations to make a continuum of focal points. And the effect is sharper vision and less side effects that we commonly see with uh, focus, like glare and halos and loss of contrast. So with that in mind, and when CFI approached me, I said I was sufficiently intrigued to get on board. And, but more so because now I had a direct uh, experience. I would be able to test it myself rigorously 
I not just have to accept information that was passed on to me, uh, like in forums like this. I would be able to use a lens that I could study and report on, and I didn't tell CP at the time, but the first sign of trouble, I was going to fail. I was going to tell them, you can have your lens, and I'm just going to try to keep my clinic uh, full of happy patients first. But, uh, long story short, I accepted, and I'm going to re report to you now the results. We did a prospective, non-randomized clinical study last year. We did 22 subjects, 44 eyes bilaterally implanted with a mini well, PT of lens. Um, we did more females than males. The mean age is about 66. The youngest was 50, and the oldest was 78. The other data, um, the biometry is fairly on the normal range. We did just limit the astigmatism to 0.75. We didn't do anything was higher than that. The subjective refraction and the distance vision pre -op. Here's the more interesting part, the results. So, after surgery, what did we get? The, spher the mean spherical refraction uh, at the first week, which is two to eight days, this is the first visit, was 0 0.27. And this improved up to the 60 to 90 days period to 0 0.2. So, less than a quarter of a day after off the my cylinders improved very, very slightly from 0.46 to 0.45 from the second to from the first week, first visit to the last visit. So stayed very basically stable. And the spherical equivalent stayed very close to paper the whole time. This is the, these are the means. Okay. So how, how is that distributed? 93.2% of the eyes measured on the first visit were within or equal to three quarters of a diopter. And at the last visit, meaning to say at the 60 to 90 days, 100% were within 7.75 diopters. In fact, a high percentage, more than 80%, are within 0.5 or half a diopter at the end of 90 days. How well do they see it? This is really important. So if you're going to test the lens, you should be able to report good vision. So, and this is in Lockmar, so, but I'll give you a translation in the Snellen, which is more um, acceptable to clinicians. Um, on the first visit, testing each eye separately, uh, the vision is about 2020, just slightly less than 2020 on the first vision, monocularly. And at the last visit, after 60 to 90 days, it improves to between 2020 and 2015. For binocular vision, you start out right out with 2020 vision, improving to about 2015 at the third visit. If you correct for distance, the results are even better. Again, you get better than 2020 vision monocularly, and this just improves to better than 2015 vision after 90 days. Binocularly, it's the same story. Better than 2020 on the first visit, and on the last visit between 2015 and 2010 vision. This is mean distance vision. How many of these eyes see that way? 100% of all eyes, whether we tested them separately or together, achieved 20-30 vision or better. And if you give a more stringent standard of 2025, also a very, very high percentage of these eyes achieved 20-25 vision. In fact, at 90, at, uh, once you correct for, I'm sorry, uh, binocular vision is actually 100% by the third visit. Let's look at distance, intermediate, and near vision. I'll correct that distance vision. 
when eyes are tested separately, one at a time, vision is a little better than 2020. This is at 60 to 90 days. Binocular vision is better than 2015. When you correct for distance, it's even better. Intermediate vision. It's between J2 and J3 for monocular, and it's between J2 and J3 as well, but slightly better, almost J2 uh, for binocular vision. It's also better when you correct for distance. For near vision, the monocular D is about J3 to J4, and binocular is about J2 to J3. Correcting for distance, J2 to J3, and about J, J2 for um, binocular. I just put in that note down there just to give it a little reference because, uh, for example, in Europe, 2040 or 0.3 lock mark is considered a safe driving visual acuity, and that published studies have shown that 0.3 lock mark or 2040 vision for near is qualifies them to do most uh, tasks. So, how does that uh, distribute out in the eyes that we did? For uh, distance, you've already seen that 100% achieve 2032 vision. And a very high proportion of uh, eyes achieve 100, 93% 100 for intermediate. Near vision as well is really good. It's 2040 or better in more than 80% of uh, monocularly tested eyes, and for binocular vision, it's 95% achieving 2040 or better. Let me just spend a uh, slightly more time on the defocus curve as Chris did. The defocus curve is a objective measurement, and it allows us to compare different lenses uh, to, each, to each other on the level playing field because you correct for distance, and you get the best vision with the best correction for distance. And therefore, you're uh, leveling the playing field for all of these lenses. You are eliminating surgical var uh, variability, you're eliminating refractive, uh, residual refractive error, or even errors in biometry. So basically, you're testing the lens itself. Okay, so um, the key to understanding it is to remember your optics Convergence and focal points. Okay, so for example, if you ask a person to read a chart, his vision uh, using a minus one diopter lens is like reading vision at one meter. Okay. And reading at uh, minus 2.5 diopter will be like reading at 40 centimeters. Okay. So, and I put a little graphic on the side to help you. These are my numbers. And so it will help you because this is also functional. It will ask to give you an idea what these people can do with that kind of vision. For example, my patients have better than 2015 vision at four meters, which is considered the distance standard, and better than 2015 as well with vision at one meter, and greater than J1 at 50 centimeters, greater than J2 at 40 and greater than J3, between J2 and J3, at 33 centimeters. So you can see, you can fully understand what we mean by an extended depth of focus. Very clear vision over a wide range. Now, this is not scientific, but I lifted this from Professor Alford's uh, presentations, my apologies, sir, just for reference. I do not intend to show that my results are better, but what is, this tells me is that the shape of my curve is very similar to the professor's curve. And what gives me hope for this is that it's very repeatable. And when I talk with Chris and when I talk with Sotoro, they have the same experience. And that gives us more confidence when you have data that can be repeatable again and again and again. And that's what um, gives us confidence in this lens. You saw this earlier, and before we used to ask our patients to draw them, to draw the shape and the degree of the halos, but now we have a very nice tool, and uh, Chris showed it a while ago. In my patients, 
these were the predominant types of glare and halos. And in 73% of my patients, that's how more or less they would see. And in 23%, that's how they would see. Not much. And again, for reference, I'm showing Professor Alfarts, and you can see that it's almost identical. And again, for reference, uh, taking from uh, Professor Alfarts work, comparing to a trifocal, you can see the very significant difference between the mini well and a popular trifocal. This is important because this is the main thing that the EDOF IOL is going to eliminate. This is the main problem of multifocal IOLs. They can read well from far, they can read near, but they will not be able to function because of all these photic phenomena. And this is what the IOL uh, adds value. Another uh, parameter is contrast sensitivity, and you can see the high figures of log CS for monocular and binocular testing, and both for far and near. For reference, I placed my numbers against published studies. So my number for the EDF, those are my results. And when I match them against a innovative bifocal, meaning this is a monofocal with a surface embedded near section, and a monofocal which I use every day, they, you can see that there is no difference in terms of CF, contrast sensitivity. And when I compared it with the published studies of trifocals and trifocals that I have used actually, they, they are far left behind by the my numbers. In fact, they're, maybe you can even say they're closer to normal values of normal populations. Lastly, very important, because what we wanted to do is try to have no complaints from patients or have happy patients. And so the input of the patients themselves is very, very vital. So we looked at 10 symptoms. We rated them according to frequency, severity, and degree of being bothersome. And we graded them from 25, 50, 75, and 100%. So the higher the score, the better the quality of vision. So we looked at those symptoms, glare, halo, starburst, hazy vision, blurred vision, distortion, double images, fluctuation, focusing difficulties, and depth perception. And this was the score of the It's outstanding. Finally, no critique of an IOL should go without showing a surgeon, some surgeon's notes. And you can see, I found that it was very easy to implant. It did not require any change in my technique. It centered almost immediately and stayed centered even after and during the removal of uh, the OVD. So in summary, this lens gave my subject, my study subjects, excellent visual acuity for far and computer distances and very good vision for near. It gave them excellent contrast sensitivity and significantly decreased halos and glare. It didn't require any change in my pre-op routine or surgical routine, uh, technique. It was easy to implant and it centered very, very well. And above all, there were less complaints, hardly any major complaints from these patients. So the Kaparas Clinic is a little bit quieter these days and quite filled with happy. One last note. I had the honor and the pleasure of meeting the inventor of this lens last night. And what struck me when he made this little speech was that he is absolutely certain that his calculations and his theory is correct. But he always had in the back of his mind was the reality and theory, there is a gap. And he's kept awake at night thinking that his baby, his invention, might cause harm to the patients that these lenses are implanted on. After seeing 
what I've seen with my uh, 22 patients, I can tell you the chance you can sleep a little better. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paras. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Santoro Noguchi from Kobe, Japan, who will share some experience with us on his experience with the mini world. Thank you. Thank you. So, I will really thank uh, the Shifty Group for inviting me to speak here. I would, uh, would like to talk about our clinical experience with the advanced aid of IOL and the new Troika model. Uh, what does the patient see via the mouse for IOL? Uh, you just performed successful. Your patient is 2020, and your patient is but uh, unsatisfied because of the high on the Korean starburst. The number of patients who actually require the IOL exchange is only about one in one thousand patients. However, the number of patients complaining about the dyspopsia is closer to one in five patients. We need a new generation IOL. That is the uh, advanced aid of IOL. So, uh, we performed the comparative uh, analysis with uh, uh, much focal IOL. That uh, much focal IOL is uh, commonly used in Japan. Uh, Red Sim plus X, uh, fine vision and for the uh, trifocal and bifocal ZKB, ZMB, and uh, ESO IOL, mini well ready, and uh, Symphony ZX uh, there is no significant uh, difference between the, uh, these groups, uh, concerned about the mini age and the eye length. This shows the visual acuity in six point, uh, five meter to 30 centimeter. We also present a multifocal IOL that CD003 to comparison. Uh, for all uh, visual acuity bio is, uh, in digital. Uh, with small focal IOL, uh, visual acuity drop down the, uh, up, uh, up below the 0 0.7, uh, but uh, mini well ready is uh, here. Uh, mini well ready is uh, uh, better than 0 0.7 visual acuity. Uh, it's maintained up to the 40 centimeter. Symphony is a uh, is a uh, is uh, uh, goes below uh, 0 0.7 after 40 cent 40 centimeter. Uh, however, the numerically speaking, near vision acuity at 30 centimeter is worse than than that of five focal IOL. Uh, these are uh, the percentage of the patient of uh, who are wearing glasses for the near vision. Uh, the usage of the light is not really different. The nearly 80 percentage uh, of patients uh, with the CD00 monofocal IOL wear glasses for near vision. As expected, uh, the ZMB, uh, the patient with ZMB uh, are wear the base layer the wear glasses because of the, uh, the additional power is for it. The, we found that the patient with minimal wear the glasses and in similar with uh, ZKB uh, 2.75 uh, 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 the of the additional and the uh, uh, trifocal IOL, very similar. So, uh, visual acuity test in the hospital is uh, very near a small part of the uh, patient's lives. So, and uh, near vision is used, uh, used in the various other situations. So therefore, uh, it is impossible to understand the uh, whole situation by high contrast uh, visual acuity test alone. So uh, we surveyed ten items uh, shown on the table based on the uh, based on the near uh, near acuity questionnaire. The survey was on the uh, level of difficulty associated with the task who uh, feature uh, required near vision. Uh, red score is the uh, significant difference. Uh, high score is indicated in uh, increased uh, difficulty. The sense minimal has a better contrast. Uh, near vision tasks were easier to perform than the uh, trifocal painting. <coughs> so next I talked about the dysphosphy. So the, this survey uh, asked to rate uh, on the scale of 10 how much hell was being experienced in the daily life at the three months after the operation. Uh, many well were experiencing notably less amount of the hell. 
Uh, on the other hand, the disruptive IOL, including the symphony, uh, were expensive to handle. Next, these were the results of the uh, Starbucks score. The results showed a minimal uh, patient uh, expensive cure of uh, Starbucks compared with the another uh, much focused IOL. These are uh, results of the multi image uh, score. Uh, there were some high score uh, patients in the dentist group. This comfort uh, with the symptom of the multiple image uh, monocular diplopia uh, is a severe and uh, need to attention. Uh, on contrary, the mini bell has a few issues with the multiple image. Finally, we asked the question about the level of the discomfort uh, experienced during the daytime or and nighttime. Uh, there was no significant difference uh, between the groups uh, during the daytime. Uh, however, the differences were significant at nighttime. A minimal patient barely experienced nighttime discomfort. Uh, and this score is nearly zero. Uh, showing the uh, significant difference from the other group. Uh, so another much focus I will have a very high school patient. They will become unsatisfied. These results uh, indicate that minimal has the only length uh, uh, that did not interfere with the nice time activity. So we un uh, understood the minimal patient is uh, comfortable at night. So how the patient actually uh, see with the milk focal IOL? To know about the actual vision, to use the brain housing meter, size and intensity could be uh, select for the each category of the brain health. So the image simulating uh, this is the trifocal public, the bifocal ZKB, uh, Symphony, ZMB, the Technics Pro group. Uh, both of them are, are the, have the def uh, deflection plating, so uh, they are the strong halo. And this image is the uh, lentis. Lentis have the uh, asymmetrical glare. Uh, however, the mini well, this is the mini well, uh, very little glare the halo uh, in simulated image. Uh, 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 Minimal image was uh, very similar to the monofocal IOL ZCB. So, to know about the laboratory image with the Minimal, we experimented by the model I. This model I have the same uh, spherical and uh, chromatical ablation of the Japanese people. This one. So, this image was uh, taken with the digital camera without the autofocus. Uh, autofocus function. The focus fixed on uh, this this point at the uh, five meter this distance point, and the panoramic image uh, taken, uh, including uh, through to the thirty centimeter point. The image with uh, minimal appeared as if the there is uh, auto focused uh, from the distance point to the near point. So uh, the minimal has also well contrasted and uh, continuous focus uh, without a waxy vision. Uh, this is an last uh, panoramic image of the uh, visual kit uh, test chart. The uh, uh, focus is maintained throughout the whole chart. Uh, at some same 30 cm it becomes a slightly far, but the clearly showed high focality uh, uh, with minimal. Um, this image was uh, also taken in a low light condition. You can see the, this uh, light image. Uh, there is no halo and the gray, very so and uh, very good uh, color, bit clear color. No waxy vision, no ghost, no gray. Uh, we can see the in laboratory data is good, very very good data. So. Uh, uh, we have uh, some experience with the uh, minimal toic, so I want to talk about the minimal toic. We performed an implant uh, for the 57 years old female. Uh, he, uh, she had a very mild cataract. She had a uh, corneal astigmatic like that. The post-operative data and collected visual KT at far vision, 5 meter, the 1.0 and the 0.7 at 30 centimeter. And there is no rotation uh, of the lens. 
And uh, with the real front and uh, with the analyzer, the total common asymptotism is uh, disappear uh, to uh, well uh, the corneal corneal asymptotism is properly uh, corrected. Since uh, preoperative data, uh, the results show that the preoperative uh, prediction of the mini well this one. Uh, so a calculator was very similar to the uh, host operative uh, reflect uh, host operative reflection. So finally, uh, at the three months after the operation, we asked the patient if you were to undergo the operation again, would you uh, like would you like the semblance to implant it? Uh, the score there indicates that they would definitely want the same lens to be used. And score three is uh, uh, indicate that we uh, they don't never want to send lens to be implanted. The results the results show the mini well the average of mini well is a uh, uh, the very good uh, score. And then uh, there was no uh, mini well patient who would uh, decline using the same lens again by giving a score uh, two or three. Uh, but the another uh, much shorter IOL, the, there is a sound patient of the uh, score two or three patient. Uh, so this is show that the patients are highly satisfied with the uh, mini well. So that's all. Uh, thank you for uh, listening. Victor, join me up here, please. Our last speaker for this afternoon's symposium is Professor Gerd Alfad from Heidelberg, Germany. Uh, again, he will share his experience with us. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's also a pleasure to learn, uh, get to know the brain behind this technology. I'm very, very happy uh, to meet you. And uh, hopefully, we can discuss also a little bit. You have already heard a lot of things now about the mini well, and you have seen mm -hmm. different people uh, coming from different countries having had the same experience. And, uh, and that is the beauty of this because uh, coming from Europe, where uh, the eyes are a little bit different than the Asian eyes, we can say that we have uh, exactly the same experience, and some of the data match very well. Um, I'm going to present you a part of uh, a multi center study that we are doing. These are my disclosures which is called the focus study. As you can see, it's a, a prospective uh, multi-center uh, multi study, um, which um, is focusing on all aspects of the visual outcome of the lens and also some special testing that we have done. I don't want to repeat uh, the stuff that my predecessors have talked about. I would like to focus, for example, on one or two more important topics. When we talk about uh, EDOF lenses, there's always the problem that there's not sufficient near acuity, especially on the models that are so, so far on the on the market. And with the mini well, we have seen already that we have much better values. But there's more around uh, uh, near acuity, just looking at some numbers on the chart. You can actually uh, look at the reading performance from different angles. And I'm going to share with you some of the uh, tests that we did with the so-called Ratna reading charts. But you also look at the reading speed and things like this. In a normal uh, eye, um, a reading speed, uh, which we would consider as a, as a fluent reading speed, something you really read uh, without uh, uh, pointing at it and looking at it uh, very detailed, is like 80 words per minute. And uh, there have been studies showing that in classical bifocal, microfocal lenses, uh, you hardly get up to 60 words uh, per minute. Um, and the patients really need a little bit more time to read some things. So we took this threshold here, 80 words per minute, and in order to uh, look like an A5 book size, you need at least 0.5 uh, long rat in order to see that. So this is here the point where you should uh, fix that, and you see already that the performance of the medieval is, is much better uh, concerning this point with and without correction. When we look at the uh, binocular reading speed uh, in our patients, and if we say we need 0.5 long rod and 80 words minimum uh, a minute, we can see that 93 to 94 percent already achieves that of these patients. And this is the binocular reading speed with corrections for distance. So we cut out all the side effects that we have from 
slightly myopic refraction from slightly residual astigmatism, which usually gives you also a little kick in terms of the acuity or intermediate acuity. So this is a way you have to test the real performance of the lens if you cut out any kind of refractive error. So this is pretty good. If we, if we look at it uh, uh, here, you see the distribution of binocular distance correct reading with more than 80 words per minute. You can see that 0.5 uh, is with 92%. Uh, and uh, you can even go up here, 40% uh, reach 0.3 and 22, 0.2 uh, with this reading speed. If you look at the uncorrected visual outcome, you have almost identical data here, as you can see. Also around 92, 93%. Uh, so there is a slight uh, refractive uh, advantage uh, in these patients, but it doesn't really uh, come into a significant level of, of uh, uh, statistical analysis. But we compared that the binocular distance corrected and uncorrected uh, reading speed was uh, essentially the same. There was no statistically significant difference. So this gives us uh, confidence that not only reading is good, it, it is also in a natural way. Patients can read at the normal speed and they used to do it when they didn't have a cataract when they were young. The other aspect I want to talk about is the, the side effects, but I also want to look at some other uh, factors here that, that we have heard already before. We know that with the other multifocal lens technologies, uh, really a big number of patients suffer from this. And a lot of times patients come to you and they show you funny drawings, uh, how they perceive these things, or they try to make a photo and show, show to you how, how it looks like. And you have already heard about that. If you look at this in detail, the uh, program offers you to differentiate between classical halo, which is called like H1, uh, um, so-called starburst type uh, uh, halos, which is H2, or some kind of fuzzy uh, uh, rounded uh, halos, which is H3. And also the types of glare is like a, uh, this type of, of glare here, or these kind of shadow images, this is G1, G2. And apart from this, you can also do the size and the intensity of these side effects. And this is uh, applicable for halo as well as for glare. So there's a lot of things you can, can look into here. Again, uh, um, here we see this differentiation. Um, there are some predominance for certain lenses, for example, the panoptics or the symphony is very often a starburst type of halo, whereas some of the other trifocals, like the eyes or so, has more this kind of type uh, of halo, H1. But let's look at ours. So, as we already heard in the other, and this is a prospective trial uh, with the European population. Here again, 73% didn't show any halos. 81% didn't have any glare. But let's look at those 27 and 90% that we have. How, how do they look like? Now, here we have um, the statistical analysis of all these values. So these are smaller numbers, of course, just 18, 13% uh, of the patients. And the values that you have here, you have to remember that uh, the maximum would be 100. And uh, we are here between 23 and 42 maximum of uh, size and intensity uh, on this scale for our patients. So here, those images of those who report no halo nuclear. And obviously, this is like this. So just the normal scene, like a monofocal lens. Here are those who say, I see this kind of round type of classical uh, halo uh, type. This is what they see, uh, and we see here uh, well, moderate to, to low or minor intensity and setting of this. This is those who complain about a little bit starburst appearance, and you can see this here. Again, this is just 9% of all, all, all the patients, which is a fairly low number. And again, halo and the settings are in the uh, lower to uh, moderate uh, range, as you can see here. And there were even uh, one or two patients that had this kind of fuzzy uh, appearance, a kind of also mixture between uh, all of them. And you can see the kind of uh, performance here. We also did a, a questionnaire with them, and I don't want to repeat the other one. 
And uh, as you can see, you can hardly read anything here. <laughs> but what I can tell you, uh, here is a, is a scale which starts with five. And everything which is below five means not at all. And then from five to uh, 10, uh, it's uh, a little bit. And more or less all of them are below the threshold here. Uh, just uh, one little outliner. But you can see that regardless of the uh, type of questionnaire you have, uh, in terms of quality of life, surgical, uh, post-surgical uh, need for glasses or spectacles, uh, the medieval performs excellent. Even the other questionnaires you heard from, from my uh, other, other colleagues uh, have shown uh, excellent performance in this subjective uh, questionnaire. So this is also a very, very interesting uh, outcome that we can see here. So on this sub-analysis of the focus group, we can say that we have uh, excellent reading performance in terms of reading speed and uh, reading acuity. The incident intensity of photic phenomena and halo gets extremely low. And uh, it is interesting to research these 23 or 9%, why do they perceive this different type of foci? We still kind of look into that in order to see, can we uh, even do something on it? Maybe it's just related to some uh, wavefront error in the cornea or uh, induced surgical sequence, whatever. Maybe we can even cut that down even further when we go with the sub analysis of these smaller groups. I think this will help us uh, quite a bit. So, thank you very much for your attention. Stay there with the mic. Uh, I'll begin the discussion uh, basically by asking the panel, I mean, with the very wide range of uh, multifocal lenses available to us surgeons right now. How, how does one choose between a mini well and maybe a diffractive? Well, um, when I have all the technology available in, in Europe, especially in Germany. We, we really have any kind of lens. And we have customized lenses here when it comes into uh, toric uh, lenses and so on. And um, what already has been said uh, by, by the first and second speaker, the uh, chair time and, and the problems that you usually have with these lenses is extremely low with mini bell. And uh, a lot of patients actually are pretty good at form. They come to you in terms like halo glare, even a simple patient has heard of it or uh, has, has somebody had an internet research and say, uh, uh, talk about that. And, and this is a, if, if somebody is only mentioning these words, I, I always turn to, to the mini bell. Yeah? And, uh, and the other thing is uh, the near acuity. Uh, if you are really, let's say, have a very high myopic patient, which is minus 10 or so, you may look into other technologies to give a, a very good near acuity. But anything else, uh, um, the near acuity of the mini is, is much superior to the others. So uh, I asked uh, my patient, and uh, uh, I talk about the uh, near vision visual acuity and the uh, uh, date of the halo and the intensity of the via uh, the halo. Uh, so, so my patient did choose the uh, diffractive or a sector and the abdominal. So, so I don't uh, uh, force the uh, choice the that one, that one. But my patient is a uh, select. But uh, nowadays, uh, my patient, uh, uh, almost patient choose the video because of the uh, brand health. I, I think uh, one of the things I found very useful is actually the Glenn Halo Simulator. I mean, if, if you put that up and show that to patients, yeah. patients immediately will, will, will choose the minimum. Actually. So, so, I mean, it, you know, picture shows a thousand words. And, and patients usually know this kind of thing, even if they uh, uh, have not been operated on. Yeah? If they, uh, even if they have, yeah, they know it from their contact lenses, having glasses, having dry eyes, that there is such, such a thing. And they directly understand uh, uh, what you mean. And when they see the pictures, it's just confusing. Any comments? Well, um, I'm having shown you the complaints that I've seen from my patients. Um, I, I find it difficult to offer any other kind of lens, knowing what I know now, except maybe for some of the assessments that the professor said. Um, I was just interested when you mentioned uh, the effects of dry eye and how these. I was a little bit, uh, curious what the kind of uh, effect of uh, ocular 
surface problems would be steps. Yeah, I think this is something we always have to keep in mind. If we use surgery on patients and we treat them laterals afterwards, and we are talking about this age group, uh, the cataract age group, there's always some dry eye uh, uh, problems involved. And uh, this can go along also with a little bit of neuroadaptation problems. So in the first two, three months, uh, it is very important to treat the patient very good in terms of the dry eye to uh, give him the possibility to adapt to the technology and also to understand uh, what's going on. Sometimes uh, early post-op results that show some glare or halo with the medieval are more or less related to dry eye symptoms and not to the technology. And uh, um, so dry eye in multifocal in general or need of lenses is a hot topic nowadays and, and really needs to be addressed. On the other hand, it gives you some time. If you want to guide the patient through the process of neural adaptation, um, you can keep him busy with uh, some treatments for his dry eye, and then the patient kind of slowly adapts and treats his eye. And this goes along quite well. Um, I'd like to invite questions from the floor. Are, are there any questions? If so, please raise your hand and somebody will bring a mic to you. Can I, can I just ask uh, if one eye has been implanted with the monofocal ILL, do you recommend? Uh, the patient will have uh, either well in the other eye. Yeah, there's no problem in doing that. Uh, um, it can happen that you have a situation that the patient has already uh, a lens on the eye. You can do the, the mini in the other eye. He won't have a, a, a problem, problem with this. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't do it on purpose, but it could happen the situation. Or if you have like a mini in one eye, and then the second eye, you have some problems with surgery and you have to put a monofocal lens in. This also goes along quite well. It just reduces a little bit the binocular effect for the near, but they have a very good intermediate vision. Because for effective multifocal ILL, usually they don't recommend <coughs> to put only one eye monofocal, the other eye effective multifocal. Mm. Because the patient may notice the difference. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's uh, not that bad. No, that I think uh, that, that's a valid concern because of the side effects that you get from this diffractive multifocals. One question I ask myself in that situation is, is whether or not I'm, I'm going to do something that's going to benefit the patient. And I think in this case, I clearly am benefiting, benefiting the patient and I have uh, you know, basically no, no qualms uh, putting in this lens. Uh, if I can add, uh, if you saw the uh, contrast sensitivity uh, comparisons, as well as the clear and halo, the mini well is almost like a monofocal, so there shouldn't be any difference between. Yeah. I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Victor uh, how to uh, select the first uh, or the, the first 10 patients uh, for implant uh, uh, EDF OF. Well, the, the inclusion criteria included, of course, uh, cataract. The exclusion criteria uh, make it more important. Uh, we try to avoid the uh, ocular surface problems. And, of course, you don't want to do very high cylinder. Uh, so the limit was three, three quarters of the barrel, 3.75. Um, I like to do topography on my patients just to know if there's any Major problem in the cornea. Um, doing wafer barometry before surgery would be helpful. If we had it, I would probably do it all the time. But I found it easier with having done the first 10. I found that you didn't, I didn't really need to do as much chair time with the first 10 if I already knew uh, that it would be performing that well. So, my, my point being, um, the screening criteria that I put up a while ago that most people will talk about probably doesn't apply as much to this lens. I think one thing you'll find is that the reservations you have regarding multifocal lenses in the past, I mean, some, some of us may have gotten burnt a little bit with multifocal lenses, they, they don't apply as much. I'm not sure if the rest of the panel agrees with me. Yeah, I think for those who was, were, who've never really use multifocal lenses, it's a good, uh, good lens to start to get in the toes of category. Yeah. Yeah. And Juliet, one last question is from me, is that uh, I have reservation always to put multifocal ILL in patients with glaucoma, 
but we you have reservations to use these lands in your conversations with fiscal field defect. Of course, it's very, very, very narrow. This field, you, you may not get benefit from any multiple koala I understand that. But yeah, but I mean, you can, it's not too bad. Yeah, but in, in, in early stage or even moderate glaucoma, well controlled nowadays, we can control uh, glaucomas. Uh, if they are not very malignant, we can control them quite well. And uh, this type of lens is, is capable of, of uh, being used with this, with this patient. I wouldn't say this is the uh, number one indication yet, but uh, uh, you can do that, and I don't think you, you do, do more harm than you do with a wonderful lens. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our symposium. Thank you very much for attending, and we hope that the information presented has been of some use uh, to you. Thank you.